Hi everybody, welcome to Top Tip Tuesday. Today we're diving from a liveaboard. Huge dive boats with cabins that can really get you out to those hard to reach dive sites and rack up your dive count. So let's jump straight into some tips. You really don't need much on a liveaboard. Clothing can be kept to a bare minimum, especially footwear. Most divers just bring a handful of diving tees and board shorts and the rest of their gear is just dive gear. Depending on the climate, you'll be barefoot on board at all times. Uh, it's only really traveling to and from the liveboard where you're going to need any kind of shoes. That and your dive boots, obviously. But check your itinerary as well, um, just in case you do have some excursions. But for the most of the liveboards that I've ever been on, you don't need a selection of shoes. Electrics on a boat aren't the same as your home. There will be charging points dotted around and inside of your cabin, but do your best to never leave anything charging unattended or leave lights on whenever you leave a room. Leaving multiple items on charge can actually overload some of the wires and start fires. So if you need something charged, either be with it and then unplug it whenever you're done. Or some vessels actually have dedicated safe charging zones where you can leave gear. There's usually someone around it or it's a fireproof area. But do be very careful when you're charging things up. You'll be diving a lot, and in certain climates you can get dehydrated very quickly. Most liverboards I've ever been on have water coolers dotted around on each deck so that you can refill a water bottle as often as you need to. You're usually offered a fresh um, disposable water bottle on day one, but to try and reduce plastic, it's always nice if you can bring your own reusable water bottle to top up. This also helps to identify your water bottle from everybody else's, because if everyone looks the same, it gets a bit messy. Stay organized and keep all of your stuff together. Liverboards are very comfortable places and you tend to make yourself at home very easily. Because you have free roam to most of the vessel, you'll find yourself putting things down and then forgetting about them. Uh, I mean, a crew member might tidy them up. So even if you do remember where you left it, it might not be there when you go to find it later. So try and keep your stuff together, try and keep it safe in your cabin, and try and go out of your way to try and keep things as tidy as possible so you don't end up losing stuff. If you have any allergies or dislike some types of food, then let them know as early as possible. Once you've left port, you might not touch dry land again for the entire week, and there aren't any supermarkets out at sea to stock up. You can sometimes get some small uh, some resupply boats, little boats that drop off fresh food and collect any rubbish throughout the week. And there's usually plenty of choice for each meal if you don't like one particular thing. So breakfast, lunch and dinner, you do get a choice. It's not just this is what we're all having, but it's best to let them know as early as possible so that they can get a safe choice for you before they actually set sail. Be aware of wet and dry areas on liverboards. If you look down at the deck, on the dive deck is going to be a fairly coarse wood. It's fine getting that wet, obviously. But as soon as you step inside, it'll often be a polished, shiny wood. If that polished wood gets wet, it is slippery as heck. So after a dive, if you haven't dried off completely, don't go in there yet because you're going to make it wet. The next person to walk through might not notice and then they're going to slip and hurt themselves. There's no rush on a liverboard. You can wait five minutes to dry yourself off. And if there's something that you desperately need inside, there's gonna be someone around who, if you ask them nicely, they'll go and grab it for you. If you get the choice of where your cabin is, try and be as high and as central as possible. The engine is usually at the back on the lower deck, and because you often travel at night, you'll get the hum of the engine throughout the night and the compressor as they're refilling scuba cylinders throughout the day and the night as well. The air is often a bit fresher on higher decks, which can be a bit nicer. And you don't tend to get as much movement when things get rough. So try and stay as central as possible and you should have a more comfortable time. 
You can complete a full dive itinerary on a liverboard, but it can be quite ruthless. Some have four dives a day for five days that start at 6 a.m. with a dive before breakfast and then three more dives after that throughout the day. And even though diving seems quite chilled and relaxed and you don't really do anything between dives except eat, it can really start to take it out of you, especially when you get to days three, four and five. So just take a dive off from now and then. Just do be sure to let the dive guides know so that they don't think you're in the water left behind when you're actually below deck snoring. Nitrox honestly helps with fatigue on multi-day diving, so you'll come back more refreshed after your dives. Some vessels, it's free. You get free Nitrox for the entire week. That's just a no-brainer. Otherwise, do make sure that you check on the cost of each fill, because each fill can start to add up, and it will definitely be on your bill at the end of the week. If you're not Nitrox certified yet, you can usually do the course on board between dives. It's a pretty quick course, it's a dry course, and it's usually the most recommended course to do anyway, so if you're not Nitrox certified, you might as well sign up. As soon as you get out of the water and de-kit, don't get lazy and head straight for your cabin or the sun lounger. Check your gear over, especially the stuff that has batteries. It's really easy to leave dive cameras or torches on for too long, and then when you're starting to get ready for the next dive, you check it and you only have 20% battery left or something. And now you're jumping in in five minutes, there's no chance of recharging it. Before you leave the dive deck, check battery levels and charge things up that need charging. Download dives so that the information on your computer isn't saved over on the next dive and download any pictures from your camera. The last thing that you want is for that amazing shot that you took on that last dive to be lost because on your second dive the housing leaked after you had a chance to transfer it but couldn't be bothered. Listen to the crew and do as you are told. If they tell you to do something, it's for a reason. They're not giving you rules for the sheer joy of it. If the rib driver tells you to swim away from the reef, then do it. It's so the boat doesn't get pushed over the reef trying to pick you up in a current. Everything from the safety briefing at the very start of the trip, pre-dive briefings before every dive, they all have important information to make sure that your entire trip goes smoothly. If you exceed your maximum dive times or go the wrong way on a dive, it can throw a real spanner in the works that can have knock-on effects for the rest of your day's diving. Exiting the water into a rib isn't always the most graceful of procedures, but it can be done. The important thing is to time your movements with the waves. Duck yourself under the water whilst you're holding onto the side of the ribs and use the boat's upwards movements to pull you up and whilst you're finning up it pulls you out of the water. As you're swimming up the boat is now coming back down so then you're nice and high, the boat is nice and low so all you have to do is just turn around a little bit and sit on the side. It's as simple as that I promise you. Ribs are fairly cramped places and gear is usually stacked up on top of each other towards the bow to keep the bow down. If you have delicate gear like cameras, dive computers attached to your BCD that you don't particularly want underneath someone else's cylinder, then grab it as soon as you get out of the water. Look over your gear and tidy it all up so that your second stages aren't right there on top and anything delicate is protected and out of the way because the last thing you want is for the next person's cylinder to go crunch it. Diving on a liverboard can be more advanced at times and it can be a steep learning curve at certain dive sites, so you do need to be switched on, literally. On some dives you may be making negative entries where all of the air out of your BCD, so as soon as you hit the water, you just keep going down. That's so that you can get below current as soon as you roll in. That is not the point where you want to realize that your air isn't actually turned on or that your weight belt is still in your crate. So make sure you do go through your pre-dive safety checks. Don't get lazy and make sure that everything is turned on and ready. It's very easy to get an ear infection, even a mild ear infection when you're in and out of the water all day, every day. The skin on the inside of your ear hole swells up a little bit when it's submerged and that can lead to little crevices that even little and nasties can actually get into 
and then they just have some fun and you're gonna end up with a little bit of ear pain or discomfort. Get yourself some ear treatments before the trip to try and kill those nasties and dry your ears out between dives. Equalize early and often as well. The last thing you wanna do is damage your ears early in the trip. If you don't look after your ears, you're gonna be missing dives towards the end and the flight home isn't gonna be great. And there were just a handful of tips that I could think of about diving from a liverboard, but if you have any other tips for other divers, let them know down in the comments below. Thank you for watching everybody, and of course, safe diving.